Internet routers, we use them in our daily lives and chances are the very video that you're watching right now is passing through a router as well. Now, usually your ISP may provide you with one, but maybe the software isn't that stable or you just want more added functionality. So you go searching online and you stumble upon custom router software like DDWRT or OpenWRT. Along the way though, something goes horribly wrong during the flashing process and the router is now dead. Has it just relegated itself to a duty of being a mere paperweight? There may be hope though, as today's video will run you through the steps into doing a hardware level recovery of your router. This guy. My name is Yang aka Tech Rodent, and this is how you fix your Atheros based router using its serial port starring the TP-Link WA901ND V3. As this is a recovery by means of a serial port, what we first need to do is to disassemble the router by removing the screws beneath it and pry off the top cover. Once open, it's quite easy to locate the serial port on the board itself as it's usually four holes in a row where the pin hitters can fit. So the next step is quite predictable then. We prep the board for soldering. In order to get the solder to flow faster and smoother while soldering, I like to make sure that both the port in question and the pins have a good amount of flux on them to make my life easier and to reduce any damage to the board. From there, we make sure that we're sticking the pins in the right way and correctly. And while holding the rows in, we solder the headers down. Just make sure that you're obviously not holding the pins in with your fingers as uh, metal is a good conductor of heat and fingers are quite sensitive to pain. Flip the board back right side up and let's get to the next step of the recovery by connecting the pin headers we just soldered in to a USB 2 TTL adapter. The model that I'm using is the PL2303HX by Prolific. Make sure that you look up the pin designations to know which is the VCC, Ground, TX and RX pins. The OpenWRT wiki is a good place to look. The VCC on the board should be connected to the 3.3V VCC on the USB 2 TTL, the Ground to the Ground and the RXD to the TX and the TXD to the RX. Once that's all done correctly, connect the router's power adapter in, connect the USB 2 TTL to your PC, plug in an Ethernet cable from your PC to the LAN 1 of your router, and turn it on. With the router powered on, you should hear the USB connected sound from Windows. And if this is your first time setting up the router, you should see it with an exclamation mark under ports. We're going to be installing older drivers in this case as the newer drivers don't seem to work very well. The ones that I found working with Windows 10 and below is version 3.3.2.102. I'll link it in the description. Once that's installed, the exclamation mark should disappear. But before we close device manager, make sure that under properties, the port settings are set to 115200, 8, none, 1, and none, respectively, from top to bottom. Download and open PuTTY, set the connection to serial, and make sure that the serial line is the same as the USB 2 TTL that we just plugged in. In this case, COM8. Under connection, go into serial and make sure that these settings are exactly as we set it up in Device Manager. Open up your network adapters window, right click on your Ethernet port, go into properties of IPv4 and manually set the IP address to 192.168.1.100 and the gateway to 192.168.1.1. The last piece of software that we need is to ready our TFTP server and for this I like to use TFTPD64. Set your current directory to the directory of your desired compatible router firmware. Make sure that the server interfaces is set to Ethernet port which is set to 192.168.1.100. 
Under settings in the global tab, we're going to turn off the things we won't be needing now. So we will only leave the TFTP server enabled. Under the TFTP tab, enable TFTP bind to 192.168.1.100 and enable allow backslash as virtual root. Note if these settings aren't saving or applying, make sure that you're running them as administrator. You can also click on show dir to get a listing of the files in that directory and make sure that your new desired firmware is there. Alright, so here comes the tricky part of things. This process happens very quickly, so you need to be fast about it. I've also had instances of it causing a blue screen on my desktop, so I suggest you close whatever you're doing and save any important files. Turn the router back off using the hardware button behind. Get your fingers ready on putty and on the keyboard. Turn the router back on, and as soon as you hear the connecting sound on Windows, click Open in Putty and start typing TPL and pressing Enter. If done correctly, you should have stopped the router from going through the boot cycle, and you should see a command line appear with either Wasp, Hornet, or UART. If you've made it this far, congratulate yourself. Pat yourself in the back for a job well done and go grab yourself something to bite. You're nearly there. We're going to type in TFTP boot into the command line and press enter. You will see a printout of stuff. You can press Ctrl and C to abort it, but there are a few things we need to make sure of here. The TFTP server should be the same as what we've set up in the network adapter and TFTPD64 and the load address, which in this case is 0x81000000. Back in the command line again, this time we type in TFTP boot, followed by the load address, which is 0x81000000 and the name of the desired firmware to push in which hopefully you've named it to something short, or you will have to type it out like I did. Once that's done correctly, your TFTP server will get to loading it into the router and you will see a bunch load of hash or sharp tags followed by a done. The important thing here is noting of the hex for the bytes transferred, which in this case is 3C0000. This is very important. In general, if your router has a 4 megabyte flash, the hex should be 3C0000, and if your router has an 8 megabyte flash, the file will have a 7C0000 hex. If your file is giving you a totally different value here, stop what you're doing and make sure you get the correct file. If all is well and good, then we can proceed to erase the firmware memory address, which will be the same size as the hex above, by typing erase 0x9f02000000 followed by plus 0x and the size of the firmware in hex, which in this case is 3c0000. This code will erase your firmware, so you can't afford to make any mistakes here. Press enter once you're confident enough and your router will get to work, finally telling you that it erased these sectors, in this case, 60. Now we're going to copy over the firmware that we temporarily stored in the load address by typing in cp.b space 0x81000000 space 0x9f02000000 and a size of 0x3c0000 in this case. Press enter. Once the output shows done, you can finally finish it all off by booting into your new firmware using the command boot m space 0x9f02000. Your router should now boot up normally, and to access it, we need to go back to network adapters and remove the manual IP configuration, and you should finally be able to access your router from your browser at 192.168.1.1 or 192.168.0.1.
I was having some difficulties in my case here, but then I found out that the Ethernet port on the back of the router was behaving as a WAN and not a LAN port, so all I did was access it via Wi-Fi and under settings, change it such that the WAN port behaves like an LAN port. Congratulations, you have successfully brought back your router back to life from being just a brick. Insert celebratory dance here. This was a really long tutorial, but one that I wanted to document and share with you guys. If you found it helpful, then you can help me back in return by liking it, sharing it, and if you're not already, subscribing to my channel. If you have comments or questions, go ahead and drop them down below and I'll be sure to read and reply them. Thank you so much for watching. My name is Yang aka Tech Rodent and I'll catch you guys in the next video.